Hi, I'm Susan Lewis from WRTI, and this is Time In. I'm here with Jennifer Higdon. Hi, Jennifer. Hello, Susan. Now, Jennifer, you are Pulitzer Prize winner, three-time Grammy winner, among other awards. You compose for orchestras, other ensembles, individual artists, opera. You have a lot of commissions this year. Uh, five, I counted? Yes, I think that's right. <laughs> wow. So how are you doing? You know, I'm actually doing okay. When this started, my first thought was, oh, thank goodness, I was behind on, on composing a concerto. So I thought, oh, I'll have a couple of weeks here where I can stop traveling and work on my projects. Uh, but I think none of us could see into the future and see that this was going to go on for a while. But the ironic thing is what composers do when they're writing is exactly what we're doing when we're staying in and not going out. It's the exact same thing. So um, I think I have slightly less energy than I normally do just from trying to figure out simple things like going to the grocery store, but I'm actually doing okay. I'm doing lots of Zoom meetings, some teaching for classes, the, and then we're just basically dealing with all the ensembles that had to stop performances. I think I had 37 orchestras had to cancel performances, and I had a couple of world premieres that have been delayed because of this. So, but I'm healthy, so I feel like I've got nothing to complain about. And did you say you were doing speeches for graduations as well? Yeah, oh, that's right. Yeah, I actually have recorded a couple. I did the, uh, convocation, the convocation speech for Northwestern University. I was supposed to be doing a, a residency there. and then, But I've also uh, sent out a couple of messages. I think Curtis had all the faculty send out good wishes to the graduates and uh, a couple other students student run groups have asked me to like leave messages for graduating classes um, at Bowling Green State University. I recorded something. So yeah, this, we're definitely at that time of year. It's, it's hard to think about what the graduates must be going through. Well, that's so interesting because I guess giving those kinds of comments or that making those kinds of remarks anytime causes you to think about, you know, what's important and what you need to tell people. So what do you tell people during a pandemic? <laughs> the first thing you tell them is, don't worry, you will come out on the other side. And to make sure you take care of yourself. This is the big thing, I think, and that we've been dealing with with students in various places is trying to make sure that everyone is okay, because everyone is dealing with isolation differently. Um, it, strangely, I'm an introverted person, so I'm actually fine. Nothing about the isolation has bothered me. It's actually, I realize being at home for such a long stretch. I've been home since March 8th. Um, it suits me. <laughs> it suits me really well. During the pandemic, I turned in an opera, believe it or not, which is a pretty big undertaking. So now I'm working on a concerto and just trying to make sure that everyone, every orchestra that has a program next year who needs a little video snippet, I'm trying to make sure I get those done. And uh, But you have to be a little more ingenious. I'm not used to being the camera person and the person thinking of what I need to say and actually saying it. So it's kind of a funny, it's a funny mix. We're having to all be very entrepreneurial. <laughs> right. And learn a lot new, a lot of new skills. Yeah, it's so true. <laughs> so what was the opera? The opera is for Opera Philadelphia, actually. Uh, Woman with Eyes Closed is the name of the opera. It's a chamber opera for five singers and 12 instruments. And we'll see if it's going to happen in September. I think we're all kind of waiting, but opera is so huge. You have to get things done in advance. And I figured if we're all in isolation, I should make sure I'm getting the whole score to the singers so they can start learning their parts. I mean, I, amazingly, my publishing is still running at full throttle. We're still getting loads of orders every day. So I figure people must be just staying in and practicing, I think. Yeah. Well, you have your own publishing company, don't you? Yes, yes. So we're 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 still we're still printing and binding and uh, making trips to FedEx, which is a little more complex now, but we're managing. So when you are when you are somewhat isolated and we're not supposed to go out and you don't uh, meet with other people, has it changed the way you compose? No, not really. It's exactly the exact same procedure, and it's pretty much. Uh, I think I probably, in truth, spend about 80% of my time like in solitary confinement in my studio just writing. I think that's very, very normal for me anyway. So it, that part hasn't been any kind of an adjustment. 
Um, it was nice to come in off the road earlier in the spring than I normally would have. And I could tell that my body had a week or two where it was healing from the travel, which is not that unusual. You start feeling it when you're probably two thirds of the way through the concert season, you really start to feel the kind of the wear and tear. So I came in March 8th. I think I finished recording sessions in Nashville, strangely, um, on like March 7th. And I flew back. And I could tell at that point that things were going to be kind of a rough, a rough ride for everyone. Yeah, it's, a, it's an adjustment, I think, for a lot of people. And I worry a lot about the ensembles. I worry about the performing groups. This is a major thing to have to deal with. Well, so now that you've been working at home in a different context, even though it's what you normally do, it's, it's still this surreal thing swirling around us. Are, have you changed anything that you do or have you discovered any, anything, uh, gone out and bought a rowing machine or? <laughs> <laughs> I did buy a car. I have not had a car for the past 22 years. I've walked everywhere. So I did go out and buy a car. When CarMax opened in New Jersey, they allow you to do things outdoors. So I did an entire transaction for a, buying a car in New Jersey. So that's probably the only thing. Uh, one of the things I did, I had, I was at the very beginning of starting the piece that I'm working on now, which is a double percussion concerto. When you're writing for percussion, you have to make the decision how many percussion instruments you're gonna have on the front of the stage for, in this case, two soloists. And so there's always a lot of debate with percussion. Do you put drums in, do you put cymbals? how many different kinds of drums. And so I actually, and I think this is from kind of the humanity, watching humanity slow down like this. I made the decision to do all of my solo instruments as pitched instruments, as opposed to using drums. I do use timpani, but they're used melodically. So it has affected me in that I wanted to write this piece, which had the potential to be lots of drumming. I wanted it to be all pitched instruments. So a vibraphone, a marimba, crotales, glockenspiel, and then tuned timpani. So that was actually due to the virus, I think. Really? What's the connection yeah. there? Um, it, it's kind of witnessing humanity not being, I think sometimes when we write for drums, we're thinking about rock and roll and excitement. And the world didn't quite feel like that when I was in the early stages of planning and trying to figure out what kind of musical material I was going to have. And because of that, it, there's a lot more melody in this. And it's interesting, through the years, percussionists have said to me that they wish they had more musical concerti, like a violinist would have. They wanted more melodies and more delicacy. And I think all the years of hearing percussionists say that. And then when I talked to my two percussionists who are going to be the soloists, they said the same thing. So it was very easy to go down that road to make that decision not to use any drums when I started thinking about humanity and how much things had slowed down. And it, it was such a poignant thing to think about. And there's always a layer of grief in these things. That's the thing. And I've been telling my students, you have to let yourself grieve. You have to let yourself grieve the change in your life and also the loss of the conclusion of the school year because basically the everyone was sent home at, during their spring break so it's there were I think there were kids who left all their stuff in the dorms they didn't even come back and get their stuff so it's uh it's a lot to deal with emotionally but music is like the perfect medium for it and it, and judging from the number of things that have been going on online it really kind of proves the necessity of music in our lives to help us in different capacities. Right. When you say that there's always grief in these things, you, you're talking about the pandemic. Yes. Yeah. I think an entire life changing to such a degree where everything shuts down. I think absolutely everyone's been going through grief of some form. It's just trying to figure out how to get yourself through it, which means everyone's tired. Everyone gets tired earlier in the day. And that's actually, that's part of it. You just kind of have to give into it and say, all right, I'm going to take a substantial nap. <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so I was going to ask, what, what's getting you through it? Well, partly napping. Yes, I think naps have really <laughs> helped. And, you know, for me, it's kind of funny. Composers, I think, right, because we are organizing our world. This is what composing is that's, that's kind of like a consolation for us. We're, we think we're controlling the universe. We're only controlling the notes on the page. But when you do something like that, it's something that's so familiar and you do it every day 
there's something in your life that stays the same despite the fact that the whole world has stopped outside. We've talked before about when you're writing music, sometimes you hear sounds in your head and, and the object is to try to figure out what instrument would play those sounds. I think we talked about that once. Yes, that's and, right. And, and so in, sometimes you end up in, inventing new percussion instruments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so, true. <laughs> so are you listening? Do you hear different sounds during this time? Because I was thinking our sound world has changed a little bit. If I mean, if you go outside, ah. you hear different sounds. I've noticed birds that I never noticed before. I think it has affected some things. I mean, I know when I'm listening to music, when I pick music to listen to, I'm, I think I'm picking calmer music. It's actually kind of quieter. I'm not going for anything that is high energy. It feels like it's too much. It feels like it's disturbing the peace. But part of me is also just enjoying opening the windows and listening to the quiet outside and thinking, wow, maybe it was this quiet when Ben Franklin was alive. You know, the building I live in was built in the 1800s. So, but I think this was the countryside. So I thought a lot about that. What did Beethoven hear? What did Mozart hear? What were their lives like? They didn't have anything electrical. Everything was either horse drawn or on foot. And that's a different sounding world. And I, so I thought a lot about that. And I've also just been kind of enjoying the quiet. There's something magical about it. And have you taken your car out? Yes, I have. I, I have indeed. I actually went out to uh, really early one Sunday morning out the Forbidden Drive out in the Wissahickon. And I just visited this past weekend, Fort Mifflin opened in South Philly, and I have always seen that fort. It was a fort built in 1777. Um, and uh, incredibly, I've always seen it flying over when you come into the airport. If you look out the window of the plane as you're landing, the fort is down there, and it's really amazing looking, but you can tell it's an ancient fort made of earth. And so it was pretty amazing to go down and explore that, gorgeous. And you could tell the whole world was very quiet. There was like no noise out there. It was just the breeze. It was incredible. Now, before you go, mm -hmm. some de the desert island question we were talking about. You know, the, the people always say, well, if you went to a desert island, what are the three things you would take with you? What are you reading? What, are you, what would you be listening to? What would you be wanting to look at? So <laughs> we're all in our own <laughs> desert islands right now, kind of. Do you have anything that, that has been... Inspired. You know, that's a good question. Uh, for me, the, this is going to sound funny, and I, this probably would not be on a desert island, but having the internet in a certain way has helped. Having computers, because there have been some things that I've attended that we've put together Zoom sessions with, like my former flute teacher. She's uh, in a retirement home in Chicago, and I think she was feeling a little blue. So we contacted a bunch of her students, and we had basically a happy hour one night. <laughs> <laughs> so the ability to research things and to check out what other people were doing artistically has been kind of a nice luxury. People have made a real effort to get their art up online, which means I've actually gotten a chance to experience more than I normally do when I'm just focused on traveling from one place to the next. I've just been blowing through a lot of different books and not reading them in any kind of order believe it or not. I was just looking at the, there's a book on Hamilton talking about the creation of that work. And I've been thinking about musicals versus opera. But I tell you, one of the things I have enjoyed while I've been going slower is a podcast called Dolly Parton's America, which is one of the most amazing podcasts I think I've ever heard. It's really ingenious and it examines culture around Dolly Parton. A lot of people don't know this, but I grew up in the same area as Dolly Parton in East Tennessee. So she was always a, a big presence in East Tennessee, but I've always been aware too of what she had done for the area in terms of getting people books. She has a literacy program that's incredible that basically guarantees if a family signs up, it guarantees a young child born into the world will have a brand new book every month for the first six years of their lives. So they have an entire library. And hearing this podcast, which was actually put out by WNYC, has been so entertaining, but it has really talked about Dolly Parton and the cultural phenomena, how she has influenced things, how people have influenced her and what she has done to help people around the world. 
So that is something I've really been enjoying. Podcasts have been, they're a new thing for me. So just having a chance to lay down and listen to podcasts and just kind of rest, it's been a new discovery. It's been a really fantastic one. Wow. So that might be something you'll continue after this. I think so. Because now that I'm like tapped into the podcast universe, I'm like, oh, this is amazing. There's, there's so many things out here that are so cool to listen to. So yeah, I'll be checking it out. Talking to you makes me feel super optimistic. About <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah, that's actually good. World and music coming into being. Yeah, it is. And you know what? This is the thing. The arts continue because people express things. And I am sure when we come out of this and we will come out the other side, there's going to be some amazing art that we're all going to go, wow, that's incredible. And that maybe it's the solitude of being very still kind of helps people I guess feel the inspiration. That's probably what it is because you have to be very quiet inside to feel that stuff. Right. Right. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer Higdon. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Susan.